Welcome to the Data Scientist Podcast with Dr. Stylianos Kabakis. Dr. Kabakis is a data scientist, statistician, and blockchain expert with a mission to educate the public about the wonderful capabilities of technologies like AI, data science, and DLTs. These technologies have the potential to transform the world, the economy, and our lives. However, there is too much misinformation around tech, and so most people are just confused about what is true and what is not. Whether you are a CEO, an entrepreneur, or just an enthusiast, the Data Scientist Podcast helps you separate reality from hype. Hi, everyone. On this episode, I want to talk about the drivetrain approach. So the drivetrain approach is a four-step process for building data products. And I learned about it from a post on O'Reilly. You know, O'Reilly, the famous publishing house for technology books. And I found this blog post very, very interesting because it provides a very good process, a very good overview of how to use data science in order to create value within an organization. So one of the most common problems which data scientists face, in my opinion, is that they might get stuck in a, in a bubble which doesn't let them see outside of predictive modeling or similar applications. However, when you work within the context of an organization, you need to be able to see the big picture. You need to be able to see the big picture. You need to be able to understand the strategy that the organization is trying to follow, the goals of the organization, and how data can help shape this. So this uh, drivetrain approach is a process which can be broken down in four steps. So in this process, we start by thinking uh, our defined objective. What is the outcome that we're trying to achieve? And then we are thinking we have to define the levers, the inputs that we can control in order to influence this objective, the data which we can collect, and also the models based on those data that can affect the levers that we can pull. And this article gives us some very interesting examples. One of the best examples comes from the story of search engines. So for those of you who are old enough to remember, uh, there was a point in time when Alta Vista was the king of search engines. So it was by far the most popular search engine. So their model was obviously not perfect, but it was doing a good enough job. But for many queries, the answer, you know, maybe it was you know, on the 10th page or something like that. And Google changed all that. So Google essentially asked a very simple question. So what is the user's main objective in typing a search query? And Google realized that the objective the user was trying to accomplish was to find the most relevant result. So what levers can we pull to influence the final outcome? Google realized that in order to show the most interesting result, the levers that they could pull would be the ranking of the search results. And the only way to get the right results at that point in time was to get data in order to produce a ranking. And they realized that the data that could be gathered easily was basically the hyperlinks from the pages. Yeah. And then this gave rise to the page rank algorithm, which we all know. And again, that's just an example uh, around search engines and how this process I mean, I'm not saying that this process was actually used by Google, but essentially the way of thinking that they went about to solve the problem was very similar to the drivetrain process. And there are some other examples which might be more relevant to, to other industries. So a very good example comes from Recommender Systems, which is an area I'm particularly fond of. The reason I like Recommender Systems is because I believe that the future lies in personalization the future of uh, retail. And we see recommender systems and related technologies dominating this landscape, the landscape of online shopping, the landscape of online streaming, etc. 
And when we look into recommender systems from this perspective, from the drivetrain approach, things become clearer. So the first thing we need to think about is, you know, you as a business, what are, are you trying to achieve? So are you just trying to sell more or are you trying to increase the lifetime value of the customer or what is your goal? And in the example that O'Reilly gives in this article, the objective is to optimize the lifetime value of a customer. And in order to do that, they take into account in this example, all the different factors which can affect a customer. So on one hand, you have a traditional recommendation engine, which simply tries to predict the product that the customer will like. But then also we have a model for the price elasticity, like how much money would the customer be willing to pay to buy products. Models which uh, predict whether a user would buy some product in any case, irrespective of a recommendation or not. And this model can be used in order to assess whether making a recommendation is actually a useful act in this case. And also, models, for example, around the patience of a user. Like if a user sees the same product again and again, do they lose patience with the recommender system? They're like, okay, that's useless. It only recommends the same thing again and again. And then all these models, they can be combined together and then we can simulate different scenarios. We can build a simulator and then we can optimize the parameters in the simulation in order to maximize the lifetime value of the customer. So again, this idea is very similar to an idea I've also talked about in my blog, the predict and optimize framework, which is about using, building a model and then running an optimization algorithm in order to find out what are the settings for this model, which can optimize an outcome. So if, for example, you're trying to build new products based on data, what are the features that these products should have in order to maximize the profit or the likelihood of a customer making a purchase. So I find this uh, framework very interesting and very useful. And I think it can provide a middle ground between uh, the data scientists and the product managers and the executives. The reason being that data scientists traditionally focus more on the modeling side, whereas product managers might be able to come up with new product ideas, but they might be ignoring some of the details behind how data science works. And this is where framework of this kind can become very, very useful. So again, to recap, this was the, we talked about the drive train approach, which is broken down on four steps. Define an objective, understand what levers you can control, what input you can control in this process. Is it the type of the product, the price or whatever? Understand what data you can collect around user product interactions, or, you know, in other settings, it might not be user product interactions, it might be something different. You know, autonomous vehicles, for example, data collection would be images from the road. This is very problem specific. And finally, decide on what models you can create, which can influence the objective based on the inputs. And once you do this, then you can run a simulation and optimize the inputs for the desired outcome. So that's a very simple, very powerful process. And if you're interested to know more, or if you're interested in learning more about data products, don't hesitate to drop me an email. I'm always very happy to discuss about this kind of topics. So that was it for this episode. I hope you found this useful. Thank you for being here with me and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Make sure to visit thedatascientist.com for more content about data science, AI, and blockchain.